welcome to the behavioral loop where you learn everything RVT, BCBA. My name is Lex and I'm here to talk to you about RVT task list breakdown. So this segment we're only going through section A which is measurement and then I will post the rest um, as the weeks continue. I am in my second semester as a BCBA student so I am pretty crammed with work but I'm going to try to get my best to get you guys all this information. So without further ado, here we go. So the first thing that you see here is the actual RBT task list. This is something that you guys should be going over over and over and over again until you're very fluent in this and that you could do it in your sleep. But this is what you need to be able to go over and we're gonna be kind of touching on uh, measurement A right here. So measurements. It is, has six segments. We have A1, which is prepare for data collection. A2, which is implement continuous measurement procedures. A3, which is implement discontinuous measure procedures. A4, which is implement permanent product recording procedures. A5 is enter data to update graphs. And A6 is describe behavior, environment, observable, and measurable terms. So we have A1, prepare for data collection. So review the data from the last session of your client. Review details on the program and the maladaptive behaviors so you know exactly how to collect the data and what the details say count as a behavior and what doesn't as well as what are the consequence strategies for said behavior task. So what that means is that when you're looking at the programs and you're looking at the maladaptive behavior, you need to know like exactly what you're looking for, like what is it that you need to be collecting. So is it SIB? Is it man for area? Like things like that. And then gather any materials you might need as a reinforcer for clients or work that might be needed for each client. So if they have time on task or other programs that involve needing certain materials, make sure to have that all ready for them. I know with my clients who really loves art, before our session starts, I literally get like a bin. I have a bin for them that I go and grab and then I bring it to their room and then I just have it there because I know as soon as they, they walk in, they're gonna be like, I want art and I'm gonna be like, awesome, let's do art um, so that we can first pair for the first 30 minutes of our session. And then, of course, just be ready, get set up and ready for your kid. So that's A-1, pretty easy stuff. And then we get to A-2, which is implement continuous measurement procedures. These are procedures to measure all instances of behavior. So you have your frequency, which is your count, you have your latency, which is the time between an SD and a response. The duration is how long something happened, your IRT between two different or two responses, and rate, which is your frequency divided by time. So here, I know it might be confusing, which is frequency versus data. So in this section, you're gonna see, you know, the date, clients, initials, the behavior that we're targeting, and the observation interval. So the interval is two minutes, the total time is 10, and the number of trials is three. So within your first trial, which is, sorry, I'm pointing, is right here. That's your first trial. These are both increments of two. So two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, which all go out to 10. Then trial two happens, and then trial three. And your total for 10 minutes interval is 89. So the data in the chart shows the number of times that frequency, which is times, which is the frequency, the client has tapped her pencil on the table during two minute intervals. So in trial one, the client tapped her pencil in a total of 10 minutes, which is 29 times in frequency. So you would take the 29 and divide it by 10 minutes to get the rate of 2.9 taps per minute. For the entire 30 minutes, which is your trial one through three, which you'll take, well, I keep pointing, you guys can't see it. You'll take all these numbers, total it up, and then right here is where you have our you total all up, you get 89, you divide it by 30, which is 2.9 taps, then is your taps per minute. And then you have your duration. Our duration records instance of behavior that occurs too frequently to count or whenever a behavior continues. Um, so we have our target behavior, which is a pretty good example. The client has been seated at the table and engaging with preferred item, which is coloring puzzles tablet without attempting to leave. You have your behavioral definition, again, which is a uh, client will sit at table for one minute without engaging in target behaviors such as eloping, tantrum, or defiance. So we have a section which they lasted 27 seconds out of the first minute. 
Um, client was able to sit and engage appropriately for short durations before displaying a target behavior. This indicated emerging tolerance, but limited sustained engagement. And then on the second chart we did, which is the 31 seconds, the client showed slightly increased tolerance by remaining seated and engaged longer than the previous trial. Continued prompting and reinforcement may support further progress toward the one minute goal. So that's just the rationale of it, like what exactly happened and explaining like what you're seeing. And then you have latency. Latency is used to determine the amount of time between the presentation of an SD and a response. So example of that would be to ask John to put on his shoes. And after six seconds, he then begins to put on his shoes. So the latency of that would be six seconds. So we have here the IoT example. So you have data collection, which is Jackson claps his hands repeatedly during group instruction, which disrupts learning and makes it difficult for him and others to focus. The BCD observes the Jackson claps on average of six seconds during instruction. So the IRT is six seconds in between the two constructive responses. So the rationale of this is Jackson will short IRT between hand claps interferes with instruction and peer Increasing the IRT will help teach self-regulation and support longer periods of appropriate classroom behavior. I know that's cut off, but it is what it is. <laughs> then we have A3, implement discontinuous measurement procedures. So we have discontinuous measurement procedures collect data on a behavior during a specified interval. So these are used if the behavior occurs during or at the end of a specified interval. So we have partial interval, whole interval, momentary time sampling, um, and play check. So what those look like, you have your whole interval recording, which is records data when the behavior occurs through that entire interval. So the pros to this is more time proficient than continuous measurement and provides a comprehensive overview of behavior during an interval. And cons, may it may underestimate behavior pattern. Splitting up a 30 minute class period into four two minute intervals and recording if a student is on task the, entire, the entirety of the two minute interval. So when you want to understand whether a behavior occurs continuously throughout an interval or when you want data to support a plan to improve child's behavior is when you would use it. And then you have partial intervals. So the definition for partial interval is records data if the behavior occurs at any point during the observation interval. The pros would be less time consuming than the whole interval recording, but the cons may that it overestimates behavior. An example for that would be monitoring if a child is aggressive at any point during a five minute interval. So when to you be able to use this is when you want to know if a behavior occurs during an interval or when you want data to support a plan, a plan to decrease a negative behavior. Momentary time sampling. So momentary time sampling. The definition for that is record behavior if it occurs at the very end of an observation interval. So the pros is it's efficient and the least time consuming method. And then cons is it may underestimate behavior. So when to use this is checking if a student is still playing with his toy during the last minute of the interval or when you need a quick general idea of whether a behavior is occurring during specific moments within an interval. And then we have play check. So the definition is record how many people in a group are on task at the end of observation. That keyword there is the group. When you're using play check, you're doing it within a group, not just one specific client. The pros to this, it's efficient way to check the on task behavior of multiple students. The cons is it doesn't measure the entire interval. So an example would be recording how many students are on task during the last one minute of the group activities. When to use this is whenever you want to assess if a group is staying on task and can't take data continuously. A permanent product might be a written essay, a drawing, even this video that you're watching right now, that is a permanent product. So permanent products are examined to determine if a task was completed. Then we have A5 data and graphs. So data for targets are gathered in each session. The data are put into the graph to examine the client's progress visually. So the success, failure, or even stagnation of a target can be determined by looking at the graphs. So the graphs are used to determine level, which is the position of the data on a y-axis, trend, which is the direction in which the data is moving, and variability, which is the relationship between the data points on the graph. So here you can see the level. The level is gonna be basically you're taking all of these points here, and you're gonna find the mean of them. So you're gonna take 66.67, 90, 100, 33.33, 100, .66 You're gonna add those all up and then divide them by seven and then you get a 73.81. That is your level line. And then you get your trend. So your trend, as you can see here on this gray line, 
is basically a starting point to see if your behavior is increasing or decreasing. And the trend line is always going to follow the data. I know this one's a little confusing because it kind of cuts off, but you see that it's increasing in time. So variability is determined by comparing data points to other data points on the graph. So variability results in the inability to determine if an intervention is working because the data points don't show consistency in trend or level. So that's something you really need to pay attention to. Make sure that you guys are marking your graphs correctly because it is so important that you are able to mark them correctly so we're able to see if our interventions are working, if we are helping you know, the kid be able to move forward in life. And then we have A6, which is describe behavior and the environment. So observable and measurable terms are used to describe a behavior and its form. So an example of this would be Josh will tap his knuckles together an audible sound with his palms facing outward, like this, from denied access. This is an example of target behavior, is tapping knuckles with audible sounds. So with this definition, another RBT on Josh's case can observe and measure this behavior and remember to use objective language and terms. Now I know this to you guys wouldn't really make sense, but when you're looking at the details of, um, of your maladaptive behavior, you really need to look and see like what is the description so that you can count this correctly. If it doesn't seem to meet the criteria, go on and meet with your BCBA and get a better explanation. Maybe they need to update it. Whatever it is, having this explanation that is very easy to understand, you can observe the behavior and understand what that behavior is and mark it correctly, that's the most important part of uh, this section. All right, guys, I know this is a super short video, um, but I hope this was super informational. I hope you have an amazing night, and I will see you next time on Behavior.